morning as we go into the chitas of today. Today's chitas stars Parshas Matis. But uh, this week we read Matis and Masay together, the two portions together. So the chitas of the, uh, the chitas, the chumash, is a little bit longer this week as we read two Parshas together. So um, we start in Parshas Matis which is in chapter 30, verse number 20, number two, in the book of Numbers. Edabim Meishal Rashi HaMatis. Meishal Abiru spoke to the heads of the tribes, of Nei Yisrael to the Jewish people, Lamer saying, Zeha Dovah Shatziva Hashem, this is what God has commanded. Now she says, over here the Torah, the, 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 the Torah talks to the Rosh, the, the, the Meishal Abiru first talked to the heads of the tribes. The Meishabin wanted the Torah wants to show covet to the, the heads and the Nas Nesim, the, the heads of the tribes, by teaching them first, and only later the rest of Israel. How do we know that he did so with, with other statements, with every, every law? For it says, Meishab called them, and Aaron and all the princes of the community returned to him, and Meishab would speak to them afterwards. It says, and all the children of Israel would draw near. So we see that 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 that, that was the like the, the, the basic system that Meshnah would first call in Aaron, and then he would call in Aaron's sons, and then he would call in the the the, the, Nassim, the heads of the, of the tribes, and then he would call in the, the 70 elders, and he would teach it again and, and again and again and again. And ultimately they would make sure that they would all know the law. The Gemara says, and they would uh, then teach it to address the Jewish people. And so why does it say it over here in this law? We're going to go into the law of a neder, the law of a vow. And so to teach us that the annulment of a vow can be performed by a single expert. That to teach us that when, you, when a person makes a vow and he wants to annul his vow, really he doesn't have to go to a, a bezdin. You can go to one person that knows the laws of vows. That's what's called an expert. If no single expert it is available, it may be annulled in three people, the layman. You can take three people together, and you can annul the vow in front of three people. Alternatively, Platt, that's why. So Rashi Amates, man, the trader wanted to tell us that you can annul the vow in front of Rashi Amates. You can go to a head. Person, meaning the Nasi was a, was, a, was a learned person, somebody who knew the laws of, 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 of vows and how to annul one's vow, and you could do it with one person. Generally, another interpretation now, she says, past measure later, this pastor is for the princes alone. However, here it says, this is the word. And in chapter dealing with the sacrifice slaughtered outside the temple, can't find Zos says this is the word, just as there as it was to Aaron and the sons and all the Israelites, so too, you cannot explain it over here that it means to only to the Nassim, the Siam. It had to be to, to the rest of the Jewish people. Zehadavar, Hashem. We would prophesy and would say, This is what God says. And the prophets also said, This is what the Abisha says. But Moshe surpassed them with, the, with, the, with his prophecy, and he would also sometimes say, When you say, then you know exactly what it is. Koi means, So says God. Like the, the example Moshe Rabbi, the, the Rashi brings is Kayam Hashem Salayla around midnight. Moshe Rabbi didn't want to say exactly midnight because maybe someone will make a mistake in midnight, and they'll say that he was wrong, the prophecy was wrong. But in general, Moshe Rabbein Nesnabe Bezeh, this is what the Abish said. So Moshe Rabbein was different than every other prophet that he would say the word Zeh. Dovarachar, another interpretation Rashi says. This is the thing is exclusive, informing us that the sage revokes a vow with the expression of hatara release, and a husband to the expression of hatara. And we introduced over to the law of nulling vows, 
The Torah gave over here a leeway to a woman. A man, when he knows knows his vow, he has to go to a, 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 a he has to go to a, a, a expert or to a bezdin. A woman, the Abishta gave the, the capability of a moment of vow right in the house, and that is through her husband or, or for the daughter a certain age through her father. So uh, we have that, the Abishta gave the woman an extra leeway. So there's two ways of annulling vows. When you go to a rabbi, he has to release the vow. And he has to say it in the way of releasement. When you go to, when a husband annuls a vow, he has to annul the vow, a fur, a And each one needs to do it their way. If they would flip it over, then it would not be acceptable. So a rabbi or a bezdin cannot annul a vow. They can release the vow. And a husband needs to annul the vow. If the rabbis and the husband would, 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 would flip over their expression or what their capability was, it would be unfit. Verse number three. If a man makes a vow, he makes an oath, to prohibit something on his soul, he's not allowed to profane his words. Whatever he says, he has to do. So Rashi says the difference between a neder and a shvua, the two expressions in this word, if a guy says, I, I make a vow, kainim is a vow, not just a, a, a vow, is by saying, I shall prohibit just like a sacrifice. Just like a sacrifice of prohibiting me. I am also prohibiting me on, 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 on such and such, such a thing that I will not eat, I will not do a certain thing. So a guy says, thus, like I can't eat a sacrifice, I'm not going to eat meat anymore. I'm making a vow. One might think that even if he swears he cannot eat nevela, makes a vow, I'm not going to eat not kosher. Or dead animal on the road. I'm not going to apply according to whatever came out of his mouth he shall do. That's a vow in vain. A person that makes a vow, I'm not going to eat not kosher. That's not a vow, because he's already prohibited for eating non kosher. So that's why the Torah says over here that you had to make a vow to prohibit something on you. That means it was permitted, and I'm going to prohibit it. So I said, I make a vow, I'm not going to eat meat. Meat is permitted to eat, kosher meat. I'm making a vow, I'm not going to eat meat. You cannot prohibit, permit, that's what was prohibited and prohibited. That's a, that's from, that's prohibited. Layachel devoted. Now she says, Layachel, the word Layachel, come here, Layachel devoted, Layasid devoted chulun. Tell you, the computer wants that every word that comes out of me, my mouth should be holy. And if I profane it, that's the concept of Yachel. I say my words, chulun, I make it profane. I say something, I don't keep it. So a man needs to keep his vow. Again, the only way he can annul a vow, I mean, I don't know, the entire vow is going to a best in at least three people, as we do Ev Russia, we come in front of 10 people, or we need to do it by an expert. But if a woman makes a vow, it's a girl over here. First start off with a girl. A girl that makes a vow, and she makes the vow in the house of her father. When she's a nura, she's in a youth. It's a very small time-wise, because we're talking about a woman as, as, a, as a, a, a na'ara in the Torah is like 12 to 12 and a half. Till she's 12, she's a katana. She's still a child. Her vows are not a vow anyway. From 12, 12 and a half, she's a na'ara. She is a, a youth. She called a youth. And then she becomes a bigness. She becomes a regular woman after 12 and a half. And now she is, she's a husband, a father cannot annul the vows anymore. 
Beis Avia, but it's Shus Avia, Afila Lebeis. She's in the possession. She's so to say the house of the father, even though she's not like, physically in her in, a, in his house. She could be making the vow outside in the sh- street. The Beis Avia doesn't not mean in the house. Say the law, but Beis Avia means you're under the roof of your parents' house. In Ureha, so now she says neither a minor nor an adult above the age of twelve and a half. So that's the that's the window. From 12 to 12 and a half is called a naira in the Torah. Since a minor's vow is invalid, who cares what a minor's vow is? It's invalid. A child, a girl till 12, a boy till 13, his vows are nothing. So you don't have to care. You don't have to annul a vow. That's a child. And an adult is not under a father. Once she passes 12 and a half, she's not already under a father. And now she becomes a bigness. She becomes an adult woman that the father cannot annul her vows. She goes into the regular laws of a vow till she gets married. What's considered a minor? Our rabbi said a girl 11 years and a day and her vows are examined. So really, did we give a year? So really, in his vows, till, and the boy also. A boy till 12 and a girl till 11, her vows are, you don't even think, think about it. From 11 to 12 and a half by a girl, we, say, we, we see if she understands what she's saying. Or a boy, 12. The 13, we evaluate, does he know what he's saying? Does he have the comprehension and the, the importance? Does he understand the purpose of a vow? And then, after 12 and a half, she's an adult. After, after 13 years old of a boy, he's an adult. So from that, a girl 11 and a day, her vows are examined. If she knew what the name she vowed, or in whose name she was consecrated something, her vow stands, even for 11 years old. But 12 years old for a boy. For the age of 12 years old, one day she does not need to be tested anymore. So from, from 11 to 12 for a girl, from 12 to 13 for a boy, we chest, test, test them out. But uh, once she becomes 12, now her father can, can know the vow. And uh, 12 to 12 and a half, once she comes 12 and a half, she becomes a breaker, so the father cannot know the vow anymore. So therefore, if she's, we talk about a girl from 12 or 11, if she's a smart girl from 11 to 12 and a half, Shama Vias Nidra, if the husband, if father heard her vow, or the prohibition that she put upon herself, and the father remained silent, decided not to know the vow. The Kamu Kolonadesh, she then heard her vows are vows. She can, un, she can annul it by going to, to the best. But her vow right now begins her vow. Whatever she prohibited on herself, she said, I'm not going to eat meat anymore. She is not allowed to eat meat anymore. But if her father hinders the vow, the day that he heard, and he said, basically, I, uh, I know the vow. Layakum, then the vow has no validity. So the Torah gave by a girl the capability from 11 to, to 12 and a half that the father can annul her vows. She doesn't have to now go to the bezin to annul the vows, to the court to annul the vows. Hashem Yislach law and God will forgive her. He hindered her because her father hindered her vow. He basically annulled the vow. So Rashi says, Hine, the word Hine, Rashi explains the word Hine, is prevent her from fulfilling the vow. That is to say, he revoked it. But I don't know this term, Hana'a, in the verse Hainia, means. However, when it says, but if her husband hinders on a day that he heard, he has revoked, that's in verse number nine. So now I conclude that Hine means to be revoked. So now she says, I really don't know what the word hina is. What's the meaning of the word? But I know that we must be that it means to revoke in, the, in this word. Literally, in terms of applying prevention or removal. Similarly, why, did it, why do you discourage, turn away, tanil? So you see the same verse, we have the word te'in, tanil. The title says, why are, you, why are you pushing people away? So you see that the word tanil, tanil, or hine, hine, hine is the word to push away. And that's what the father does. He pushes away the vow. 
Hashem yislach lo. What does it mean that Eibush forgives her? What she didn't do anything. She made a vow. She annulled the vow. So why does she need to have forgiveness? Ameha kosim edaber. Why does the pastor talk about that she needs forgiveness from God? To a woman who took a Nazareth vow. The Gemara says we have to come up with a situation that a woman took a vow and her husband heard and revoked it without her knowledge. So the father and the husband heard the vow and he said, uh, I know the vow. But she, he was sitting in another room. What happened was she did not know that, that it was a vote. And then she transgressed her vow by drinking wine or becoming unclean, touching a corpse. So she didn't know. But really, she was allowed to drink wine. But she did not know. Requires forgiveness, she still requires slicha. Because even though she's not, her vow is no. Because her father annulled the vow. But she did not know that her father annulled the vow. Or her husband annulled the vow. So the traitor says that since she didn't know. So in her, in her mind, she didn't have Veda. She did a sin because she made a vow to be a Nazarite and she drank one. Not realizing that like, later she comes to her husband or her father says, I made a Veda. I had to bring a carbon. I ate, drank wine. Her father says, oh, don't worry. I annulled the vow. I heard the vow. You made it on Tuesday, uh, 1 o'clock, and I heard it and I annulled it. That means that the husband and the father can annul a vow even without the knowledge. Of, the, of, of, her, of his daughter or his wife. He heard it. The Abish they gave a leeway, unbelievable leeway for a woman that, he, that, 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 that a husband or a father can annul a vow. And we want it. We want to annul a vow because people shouldn't take vows. Because when you take a vow, now you put yourself into a, a problem. Because not only by breaking the vow, you're doing something that is, you're breaking a vow, you're doing something against the Abish. The vow, is now you, have to be, now you have to bring a sacrifice if you did it unintentionally. If you did it intentionally, you break one of the Ten Commandments. You shouldn't make a vow in vain. So that's why the rabbis prohibited people from making vows now. We shouldn't make vows because we don't keep vows. So we should always say everything without a vow. You shouldn't ever say something and say a vow because it's very, you know, we don't want to get into the problems of vows and vows that we don't keep. So here the Tata. Times of the, uh, before the, the rabbis prohibited vows, people would make vows. It was something that kept them on the right, the right and narrow. So over here, the Abish they gave a woman and a girl a leeway out to get out of her vows, but they didn't give to men. A man made a vow. He couldn't go, his wife couldn't nullify it. He had to go to Bezin to nullify the vow. He made my wife. So if so therefore, the, she needed to have Hashem Yisachlo in this kind of situation. Verse number seven. She was betrothed to a man. And with her vows upon her. The utterance of her lips which she imposed on herself. And now she says, what are we talking about over here? This refers to a betrothed woman. There's an, in Torah law, there's a betrothed woman and a married woman. Betrothed woman is Kedushin. In those days, many years ago, they used to do two, two different times marriage. They would betroth you, betroth your wife, and then two years later, you would marry her. We don't do that anymore. We do that all together in one shot today. We do Kedushin and the Suyin. Under the Chuppah, we do everything in one time. But because we do, because this is also a very problematic situation to be betrothed a year before things can happen in that year. And, and, and if you break up, you need to have a divorce. So we try to get out of that whole, the whole situation. And therefore, today, we don't do this. We do Kedushin and the Suyin at the same time. So this refers to the betrothed woman, but in times... The times of the of, 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 of uh, the times of the Gemara, the times of the, the, the base. I mean, this was done. This was usually the tradition. Sometimes you betrothed a person very young. You betrothed her when they were kids, and they got married years later. It was something that was done throughout history. Uh, in this first stage of marriage, when the marriage ceremony has been performed, 
but the couple did not yet live together. They, they, were, they, were, they did a marriage. They did a, they did a, a, that was like a nether. They came together and we're going to get married. When are we going to get married? We're going to get married in 10 years from now. Because right now, they were 10-year-olds. So this was Kedushin. They, would, they, they did a concept of betrothal. So perhaps a, a, it's first a married woman and a sua who lives already with her husband. The scripture says if she vowed in her husband's house, it speaks of a married woman. So when later on, it talks about, about another woman, that uh, a woman that was married. So we must say this verse is talking about a woman that is betrothed. So this must be a betrothed woman. It becomes to distinguish her a betrothed from a married woman. What's the difference? In that bo both the father and the husband most invoke her vows. That's the problem with a betrothed woman. The situation, a betrothed woman, she in essence can be, if she's 12, again, we're talking about a very short period of time, from 11 to 12 and a half, both her husband and her, and, uh, both her husband who she's betrothed to and her father who is, she's living in his house have to annul her vows. Once she's married, her father cannot annul her vows, even though she, let's say, for example, she got married when she was 12 years old. That would be prohibited today, but biblical times, <laughs> that was permitted. So it comes to distinguish a betrothed woman and married woman, and then both her father and husband must revoke her vow. If her father revoked it, but the husband did not revoke it, or if the husband revoked it, but the father did not revoke it, it is not revoked. And it goes without saying that one, that if one of them upheld it, then for surely she has to keep her vow. So again, these are very intricate laws. And uh, you can learn this all in the and Adarim. Nada v'nadrela, which he vowed while her father's house, but her father had not heard them. So they were neither revoked nor upheld. She now comes into her husband's house and she says, I'm sorry, but I made a vow while I was in my father's house, while I'm betrothed, and I'm stuck. You're stuck with the vow. But, verse 8, But if her husband hears it and remains silent, I'm sorry, he remains silent, then the prohibitions stay a prohibition. So Rashi, here we see the case that if a husband upholds it, it stands. So if a woman says in front of her husband, I make a vow not to eat meat anymore, and he is silent, then the vow is a vow. And if she wants to, Annul it. He wants to annul the vows or untie it. She has to go to a court like her husband would make a vow. But if her husband hinders the vow, he knows the vow. Which is honor. The utterance that she imposed, but he says, I annul the vow. Again, we're talking about the situation. She didn't remember her husband. She didn't hear her husband and all the vow. And she went now, made a mistake, and did something that was against the vow. She comes now home and she says, listen, we have to bring a card from Khatas, because I did a mistake. He says, I know the vow. Say to serve Hashem Yisrael. I might, Rashi say, I might think even if the father had not revoked, it's, it is revoked. Scripture therefore teaches us that a youth, while a father's house, throughout a youth, she's under her father's jurisdiction. And again, this is a special law in the Torah. Uh, the law of a nida, it's a very complicated law. The law of a nida from, from 12 to 12 and a half or from, you know, that age that a, that a father can know the vows and a father can marry off the child, her, the daughter. It's, it's a very a whole different subject. Verse 10. A vow of a widow or a divorced woman. So she's like a single woman. All her vows, she has to keep, unless she goes again to the best. Since she's neither under the jurisdiction of her father or her husband. She does not, scripture refers to a widow from marriage, but if she's a widow from betrothal, as soon as she, her betrothed husband has died, she reverses the jurisdiction of, of her father. That's, that's another law. A woman that's betrothed and her husband died from the betrothal. There was no Nusuyim. He never lived with her physically. There was no sexual relationship. So therefore, she would return or she doesn't, uh, she returns to her father's home. 
because there was no nisuin, there was no ultimate cultivation of this marriage, and therefore she reverts to, to, her, to her father's home. If she vowed in her husband's house, opposed a prohibition upon herself for uh, uh, the oath. That's over here, the tale is talking about a Nasua, a married woman, a full fledged married woman. If her husband heard it and he annulled it, I'm sorry, he was silent. He did not annul the vow. Whatever her vow is, is a vow, and she has to keep it. But if her husband annuls it, the day that he heard it, what any kind of thing that she took out of her mouth to make a vow, to prohibit it on herself, it has no standing. Her husband annulled it. Hashem Yisachla and the Eibush to forgive. Verse fourteen. Nefes Isha Any vow or binding of self-infliction, her husband can either uphold it by, by his silence or revoke it. The husband comes like the best. Shnashes since the, the husband may revoke it, one might think that includes all vows. Scripture did tell us self-affliction. He can revoke only vows of self-affliction. That means, again, we're talking about a vow that a woman says, I, I, something I'm allowed to do, I'm not going to eat bread anymore. That's self-affliction. I'm not going to drink wine. I'm not going to eat meat anymore. I'm not going to go visit A anymore. Or, these are self-afflicted, not talking about something that is already prohibited on a person or something that's obligated on a person. You cannot make such kind of vows. You make a person makes a vow, I'm not going to keep Shabbos anymore. That's a ridiculous vow. It's no, it's impossible for him to make such a vow. We talk about self-affliction vows. So a person makes a vow, I'm going to eat I'm not going to eat him on your kippah. What he's going to say, I'm going to eat him on Both of those vows are, have no validation. A husband does not need to invalidate the vow. You don't have to go to Bezin because it has no value. Whether I'm going to say I'm going to eat Ayyub Kippur or whether I'm going to make a vow I'm not going to eat Ayyub Kippur, both of those kind of vows has no validation. It's actually saying God's name in vain. If I made the vow in the name of God. Verse 15. If a, if a husband remains silent from day to day, Hakim called it and in essence, he, she was in a bad mood and she kept on vowing things day after day. Hakim called it called it She has to do all the things that she says. I said, Allah, Hakim, I said, okay, hech, this is not the same. So to say, to say that he, he has the power to revoke for 24 hour period, he can, does not have to revoke it in, in, in that moment. As long as it's in the 25th period of when she made the vow, he can revoke it. But if he revokes them after having heard them, shall be her nikim. Dasha, I said, after he heard and upheld it, by saying, I approve it. And then he retracts and revokes it even on that day. Who nichtas tatel? He takes her place. He learned from, it, from here that if someone causes his fellow to stumble, he bears the punishment of his place. Now this teaches us that if a husband stands, wants to punish his wife, so to say, I'm going to keep the vow. I'm going to say it's a good vow, but she doesn't want to do that. He knows that she's, she's saying the vow in her anger, and she doesn't want to really keep this vow. And he says, let the vow stand. Thus to, to, to hurt her, that, and then he says later, oh, I didn't mean it. I, uh, I I really want to know the vow. Then the Abish says, you're not a, you're such an evil person. You carry the sin. I consider it as you made the vow. This is the law that God said to Meshach The law between a man and a husband, between a father and his daughter, when she's a nara, 12, again, 12 and 12 and a half, and she's in her father's 
Chapter 31, verse number one, Rabbi Shalom, Rabbi Shalom, God said to Meshach, same the Kerem, Nikos, Tamrei, Saul, Mesa, Midian, take revenge for the children of Israel against the Midianites. Achate, Asa, Mecha, and then afterwards you'll gather to your people. Now she said, this is a very interesting expression in the Torah. The Torah says you should do the Kama. You do the Kama. To, to take revenge, and you should take revenge against the Midianites. So actually, what about the Moabites? The Moabites and the Midianites came against the Jews. The Moabites were involved in the matter out of fear. So the Rashi said, different than the Moabites, the Midianites, is that the Moabites came against the Jews because the Moabites were afraid of the Jews. The Midianites were not involved in the situation. They had hatred against the Jews without any reason. It was the baseless hate. And because, as it says, did not provoke them into battle. It says, hopefully, Meshach Rabbeinu told the Midianites, we have nothing to do with you. We cannot even take your land. Because God had commanded us not to get involved with you. The Midianites were angry over the dispute, which did not concern them. The Midianites got involved with the Moabites, and they had no reason to get involved to fight against the Jews. The Moabites, it's understandable. They knew that the land would be taken over. But the Midianites had nothing to be involved in doing. So they basically went against the Jews out of hatred. Sinas Chinam. And they even said that you have taken revenge. Sinas Chinam. Faces hate. Got to be eradicated. Another interpretation because the two good does, virtual, virtual two great people that are going to come out of the, 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 the Moabites whom I have in mind to bring forth from them, namely Ruth the Noabites and Nama the Ammonites. So these two great people, not, especially the Moabites, is Ruth. Ruth comes out of Maya. God says, I see great people coming, great women coming out of the Moabites and not the Midianites. Nothing good is going to come out of them. Spoke to the people. He said, We have to go out and take the comma from the Moabites, from the Midianites. I'm sorry. I'm amongst men of the army. Here are Midian, and we're going to go out against Midian. Lost is Nishkmas Hashem the Midian to take revenge of the Lord against the Midians. Now she says, Although he heard that his death depended on this matter, imagine. God says to Meshach, I mean, go out and take the common of Midianites, and then you're going to die. So Meshach said, okay, good. I'll do it in a month. I'll do it in a year. Right? So why should I rush the situation? The second Meshach Bain heard a command by God, even though he realized that by after this victory, that he's going to go out to war with the Midianites, he's going to pass away. He didn't, didn't, uh, didn't face it. He said, let's go out to war. He halts it. The time we could just a sense of army for battle, a notion. Get men who are righteous. Choose men that are righteous. Nikmas Hashem. For anyone opposing Israel is reckoned as opposing the Holy One, blessed be Nikmas Hashem. This is an akama for the Abishta. It's not a comma for us. The Midianites went against the Jews. But going against the Jews is like going against God. Elaflamata, take a thousand for each tribe. We need a thousand from each tribe. The tribe of Levi didn't go, so we need 12,000. 12,000. There was 12,000 men. Kaluti Tzav. Gashi says, passive form is used to inform you that the virtue of the Israelite shepherds, leaders, who cherished they were, how cherished they were by Jews. They had not yet heard of his death. What did they say? Just as the longer they will stone me, but as soon as they heard Moshe's demise was continuing upon revenge against minions, they refused to go. So what happened was, everybody said, we're not going to war. Why? Moshe Abedin might want to go to war, but we're not going to war. Until Moshe Abedin said, my friends, you've got to do that. You need to come to the war. I know that you're trying to protect me, but we are going to do the God's will. And God wants us to go out against me. For each tribe, 
to the army. As Pinchas ben Elazar the Kain sent Pinchas the son of Elazar the Kain Litzava to the army, Leklea Kedesh and the holy vessels, the Chatzleis and the and the trumpets, a true biyade in the hands of Pinchas. Roisam as Pinchas. This shows that Pinchas equaled all of them. Why did Pinchas go? And Eliezer did not. Eliezer was the Kain God. Only one blessed me. He saved the one who began the mitzvah by killing Cosby. The daughter of Tzur, which finish it. That was the story of Pinchas. That was last the last week. Pinchas, two weeks ago, ended. And Pinchas came, caused me Basur to the she was the princess of Midian. So he said, Now you gotta finish the job. You gotta go out and destroy the whole Midian. Other interpretation, he sought the vengeance of Yasef, his maternal grandfather, says, and the Midianites sold him. How do we know that Pinchas' mother was a descendant of Yasef? As it says, Eliezer, the son of Aaron, took himself to the daughters of Putiel, meaning the descendants of Jethro, who fattened the calves for the idolatry, and for the descendants of Joseph, who made light, Peter, his passion, and prevailed over him when he tempted Potiphar's wife. Another interpretation, he was the Kayan anointed for, for war. So either way, he was, a, he, was a, a, he, was a, he was the one who started the, the, the whole situation with the Midianites, or Pinchas was a descendant of Yosef, or Pinchas was just Meshuach Muhammad. There was one, there was always a coin who went out to war. He was called Meshuach Muhammad, anointed for war. Because the coin go out with the war with the Arin. So the Krihanim, Sutra Kahana, went out with the war to war. And there was a there was a coin that was that was anointed for this purpose. Or clear Kaidish, because he the coin needed to take out, as Ashi says, Zaharin Batsit. This is the Arin and the golden showcase. Since Bilam was with them, and through sorcery was able to make the Midianite king fly, a medish, he flew amongst them, along with them. He Pinchas showed them the showplace on which God's name was engraved, and they fell to the earth. For this reason, it says concerning the Midianite kings upon the slain, he fell upon the slain, as you soon see. For they fell from the ear to the top on the slain. Likewise, it says in the book of Yeshua, in connection to Bilam, upon their slain. So the Bilam gave the, 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 the Midianite kings spiritual powers. The Yadai in his hands, with the in his hands and his possessions, taking the land in his possession. In essence, the Abishta always sent the Kehanim and the other to give spiritual strength to the Jewish wars. The war was, was not a battle only in the, on the physical plane, it was a battle also on the spiritual plane. They attacked Midian. They killed all the males of Midian. And the king, they killed the Midianite kings upon, upon their slain, as we just said, Rashi explained. Five kings of Midian, Chamesh Malchimid. As Bilam ben Be'er, Bilam lived in Midian. Hargu Bechorev, Bilam was here killed by the sword. As she says, you and I see the verse list five. Why is it necessary to scriptures to say five? We can count it ourselves. But teaches you that they were all equally involved in the conspiracy. And they all received the same punishment. Bilam went there to Midian to receive his reward. The 24,000 that have fallen from Israel as a result of his device, advice. So now he left Midian to meet Israel. And he offered them harmful advice. He said to them, if you have 600,000, you could not overcome them. And now you have 12,000. And you come to fight with 12,000 Jews. Are you serious? You're coming to fight five kings. 12,000 of you. He gave him his just desert, desert and full without depriving him. At least they killed him. Bacherem, who Baal you saw, he came against the Jews, exchanged his craft for their. They are victorious only with their mouths through prayer and supplication. And he came and adopted the craft to curse them with his mouth. So too, 
So they too came against them and changed their craft, the craft of the nation. They took the sword. So Bilaam thought the Jews would never use the sword. But they told Bilaam, just like you took our craft, you used our craft, which is the mouth, prayer. You started time to pray against the Jews. We're going to use your craft, which is a sword, and we're going to kill you with the sword. The children of Israel took the Midianite woman and their small children captive. It's called Mekneim and all the beasts, all the flock. It's called Chelem Bazazu and all the processions. Verse number 10 was called an image. Verse number is called Tidos and Shafarash. And all they set fire to all the residential cities and their castles. Asher said, Tidos and his capitals, capitals. Is uh, his castles. Verse eleven. Yikol kolas kol ashalav the zamakay and bade mehema. They took the booty, the plunder of man and of beast. Now she says this teacher that will be virtuous, righteous, and did not suspect it to theft, to appropriate, to appropriate the booty without permission. But it says all the booty, all the what they took. In addition, the prophets is written scripture explicitly refers to them. Your teeth are like a flock of ooz. Even your warriors are all righteous. Shalom, movable objects such as garments and ornaments. Buzz, the nate's plunder of movable objects which are not ornaments. Malkeach, what is the plunders? Rashi, man and beast, when the captives is mentioned together with plunder, the captive referred to people, the plunder to animals. And they brought all these captives and all the plunder, the booty, the Meshe Rabbeinu and Eliezer, the Koyen, as Hashem, Yusam Koyen, Vasolom, Allah Machna, they all came to Arvis Moyav, Ayad Yerechai, they brought this all back to Moyav, which they were then camping on the Jordan on the other side of the Jordan of Jericho. And that completes Chumash for today. Now I go to the Tanya of the day, which we are holding in chapter seven of Shad Atshuva, the um, teachings of, of Tshuva of repentance. The Alter Rebbe ended off yesterday's Tanya that the Toshuv hey, the whole concept of tshuva is since that our neshama is made up of God's name, yud ke vav ke. And the hey is symbolic to the shechina, the way that our neshama comes into our body. Because we, that letter hey comes into our physical existence, we have the capability of schlepping that hey to places that the hey that God doesn't want to be. And the Shama doesn't want to be. And our obligation is to bring back that hate, to connect it to its source, to its original source, which is Yudke Vavke, which is the whole word of God, and to bring it back to its spiritual stance. In the language of the Zoya Dalta Rebbe says over here, the level of repentance entails returning the latter hate of the four letters of God's name to its rightful place, returning the Shekhinah which is the source of the Jewish soul, from the exile to which it was banished by transgression. That's our vital. For when man sins, divine vitality that flows from forth from the Shekhinah descends into the chambers of Klippa Sitak. When we sin, we're taking our neshama, we're using our neshama, the energy of our soul in sin. That is Golas Hashkina. That's like the Golas Hashkina we're doing in a personal way. Is the Golas Hashchid in the world. <laughs> and then there's my Golas Hashchid. I take the presence of God. I have within me God. Yudke Vavke. I have within me a part of God. And I slept my, uh, my godly soul into places that it doesn't want me to be. It doesn't want to be. I put it into Klippa and sit to the Akhra. I do our Vedas. I do evil thoughts and I have evil speech and I have, and that my non my poor soul, my godly soul is now has become part of negativity against its will. 
That's called it's against its will. That individual in turn derives nurture at a time of a sin. Not only now, number two is not only am I schlepping my soul into evil, I've given evil existence. And not only am I giving evil existence, I'm nurturing actually myself in this evil that I've created. This creation of my evil has now give, is giving me energy. So I'm given it energy. It's giving me energy. And now I'm living off the energy of sin. That's how far I have the capability of taking godly energy to create evil energy, to not only create evil energy, but to give that evil energy, the energy to give me back energy. So now you understand what Shuva does. Shuva, wash it, repentance redeems the Shekhinah from its exile. And returns the flow to its proper place. And then what happens? The evil loses its energy. The evil loses its energy. It dies. It disappears. This was the theme of the previous chapter. The question now that Alter Rebbe is going to answer, how do we do it? How do we get back that energy that we, that I, have took and brought it into Klip and Sitrach, and I brought it into uh, coverings and the opposite of Kedusha? How do I bring it back? Ever is a true path, direct path. The lower level of chuva. We have to start with the lower level of chuva. Hey Tata. We gotta bring back the lower hey and the scattered slave. We need to schlep it out of the evil. We, we, oh, I have, with my own free will, have dragged my energy, my godly energy, the last hey, which comes into my speech, into my action. I've dragged this letter hey, the energy of the letter hey. Hey, Tato, I've dragged it into, into the places that it doesn't belong. And based on that cloud, there are two general elements. Let's look at the explanation over here. The two elements, A. A, number one is awakening God's supreme compassion on the soul. If we all need God's help. You push it, need to beg the Abish to, because it is God Himself, that the Abish should have Rahmanis on my own soul. And number two, subjugation and nullification of the evil. In Chsidis, and we learned this also from when we listen to the Torah, there are certain evils you need to subjugate, and there are certain evils you need to nullify. There are certain evils that need to be controlled, like Moyav. <laughs> and Midian needs to be destroyed. That's evil that has, as we mentioned before, you have certain evils, which is symbolic in the seven nations. I don't want to get into that whole different subject. That there, the Abish says eradicate. The seven nations, the seven Midas Rays need to eradicate. Some aspects in your midst need to be subjugated, need to be put upon and self-controlled and elevated, and some need to be gotten rid of. So B, subjugation and the nullification of evil. Both are necessary in order to ensure that the lower level of repentance will be true and direct. The Rebbe notes, our Rebbe, Notice, although we have previously learned in chapter one that the kernel of repentance is firm and wholehearted resolution to commit to particular sin again, right? We mentioned at the beginning of again some tshuva. Alter Rebbe makes that foundation. That tshuva means I'm not going to do sin anymore. Now he changes it seemingly. Nevertheless, without the two basic elements about to be discussed, such repentance will neither be true nor direct. If you want to make sure your foundation is real, that I'm not going to sin anymore, the 
you need to, first of all, have Rachmanus on your soul that has sinned. And then you need to control it or eradicate it. True, why? The Altadeba was always looking for truth. Derech ha'emes. Mithil Rebbe said, if the Alter Rebbe wouldn't have always been looking for the truth, he would have thousands and power thousands of more chassidim. The Alter Rebbe wanted derech ha'emes. Don't, you want to live a fake life and you want to fake it, you to hate. But I am looking for the truth. A person needs to know his emes. What is this truth? Why? Because once you are truthful, you have the capability of change. It's permanent. And what you change is a permanent. If you're just going to fake change, then change will be just for a limited time, which is great. I'm not taking away from the greatness. Fake it till you make it. But you need to ultimately become truthful. We need to know a true and a direct path. You got to look in the mirror and know your truth. Truth implies permanence. As the verse says, the lips of truth shall be established forever. Should one fail to take the preparatory steps about to mention here, it's entirely possible for him that his forsaken sin, described above and repentance, will not be everlasting. Hence, not truthful. That's it. And that's why the expression of the Gemara, that the Shoy Meleim Kharote, that evil people keep on saying they are sorry. Because they are sorry, but it's not a truthful sorry. It's not truthful. And since it's not truthful, they keep on saying they're sorry. If they would once be truthful, maybe they would stop saying they're sorry. Because they would stop doing it. For a state of repentance can also be arrived at, ve at, a, at very indirectly. In the case of Lazar du Nudaya, who was led to repentance by circumstances which were in themselves evil. Famous story that Zanat Rebbe is going to bring down. Rabbi Lazar du Nudaya, who, uh, who, uh, who visited every prostitute in, in Yerushalayim. And one time, a prostitute gave him Musa. So the woman that he had it was a prohibited relationship told him off and told him about his guy had him. So he got his chuva and he did repent. He repented through this avenue. He came to repentance through a, an avenue which was unusual. That's, you could have, the Abish can bring about repentance of a person through many ways. But if you want to know, Avedis Atzmi, you want to have the, the tshuva through one's own service, then you need to create a path. You need to create a system of tshuva. I need to create what is going to be my system. How am I going to do tshuva? And now the Alter Rebbe says, how gives you, gives me and all of us a system. Again, we're not going to wait for something to happen. God forbid, some, a lot of people do tshuva when they get sick. And they, that's God coming down to a person saying, I had enough. But if I want to do tshuva on myself, I want to start returning. I realize that this is not the right way I'm living. It's time to change. So then you need a path. The first thing you need to do, the Alter Rebbe says, you need to awaken the supreme compassion and the source of mercy. You need to pray to the Ebishter, to God. You need to ask God for help to awaken mercy of my soul. There are two distinct states of divine compassion, indicating the terms merciful father or father of mercy. The former term is of harachamon, means signifies that God possesses the attribute or the middah of mercy, of harachamon. And since middah 
means not only an attribute, also a measure, it refers to the finite quality of mercy. But then there's of harachamim. The latter term is of harachamim. Stresses the fact that God is the father or the fountainhead of all mercy. So of harachamim means the father of mercy. And there we are trying to connect God, not to the middah, but to the Abish himself. Not to the attribute, but to the Abish who is merciful. If I'm going to connect to the middah, then it's going to be a finite entity of mercy. Over here, the Alta Rebbe says we need to go to the source of mercy, which is God. And that source is unlimited. And we need to reach up to Abba Rachamim. We need to connect to the source of mercy, which is God himself. And we have to ask God to be merciful without any strings attached. Unlimited mercy. And does arousing infinite measure of compassion, supreme compassion. Because why should God have mercy on us? We, it's not like he pushed us into this situation. I, myself, decided to go from a very high situation to a very low situation. Take my soul that comes from a very high place to schlep it and to drag it into places that are very low. But when I reach up to Ava Rachamim, when I reach up to the source of mercy, then it has no limitations. Shenifla me'igra rama chaye chaye baruchu that he has fallen from the lofty height, the rooftops of the infinite source of life, libido amikta, into a deep pit. First of all, I have to realize that I'm in a deep pit. And then I need to awaken up. I need to push and beg God's mercy that God should have push and achmanus on my soul. Not merely rooftop to a lofty, to, for, but for a lofty rooftop, not merely to a pit, but a deep pit. Chambers of defilement and 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 sitrachad on the soul. As explained in the previous chapter, a person's sin degrades his soul into the chambers of clippers and sitrachad, finding itself in such a sorry state. Such a soul is indeed need of God's divine compassion. One should arouse divine compassion as well for the source of his soul and the source of life, the four letters of God's name. Because again, since the soul is rooted in God's name, it is denigrated, brought about by sin, correspondingly causes the flow of holiness that emanates from God's name to descend into the chambers of Clippus into the evil chambers of this world. Hence, not only the soul, but the soul source is to be pitied. We have to push it, know, and feel the pain of the soul. If we don't feel the pain of the soul, we don't realize the truth of sin. What is the true negativity of concept of a sin? The true concept and the true pain of a sin is partially the, the, the pain of my soul. The verse says, the Yoshiva Lavaya he shall return to God and he will have compassion on it. Meaning the sinner shall to return to God and have compassion on him. How are we to understand the concept of arousing mercy for God? For the for and for God's name. This means by arousing compassion for the life-giving power issued by the name of God that has descended by the stages into chambers again of this impurity and this sitrach, this vitality that I'm giving now to the name of God into the levels of impurity. 
to the descent that was brought out through the deeds of man, my deeds, and of evil schemes and thoughts. So, Be'emes, I need to look in the mirror and realize what I've done. What I have done. Once I realize what I've done, by my act, by my thought, by my speech, then I can awaken up Rahmanis on me, that I could be such a person that has taken God, has taken my neshama, that's a chelik that's a part of God, and dragged it into the pits of pits. By Shikasim, as they have another verse, the Altar Rebbe is trying to give you different ways to look at this. Melech also I have to look at it like a king that is bound in guts, gutters. To look at my soul, I, I'm taking this godly soul like a king and look at him, he's chained. He's chained. Rebbe, explanation by the Rebbe, our Rebbe explains the Afidi Alta Rebbe, gutters refers to vicious, various channels and gutters of the mind through which thought, like gushing currents, rush fleetingly. Thus, even a transit evil thought that one harbors and, and preferably can bind and shackle the king. They can exile the flow of vitality emanating from the four land names of God. You just think about this before you have a machshav azara, realizing what am I doing when I have a machshav azara, evil thought. This is this is the meaning of the exile of the shechina, divine presence, level of malchus kingship in the world of atzilus. I'm schlepping all these godly worlds into the pits. And the best time to do this is Tikkun Chatzais. Tikkun Chatzais is to wake up in the night at midnight. Like these days at 12.45, 1 o'clock in the morning, and to sit down in, in, on the ground and hush and pray to God on the gullus of the Shechina. Stars, certain communities that do this today. Still do tikkachatzais. Wake up in midnight, and they lament over Golos Hashchina. They lament over the exile of, of, of God. Their own personal exile. As it's brought down in tikkachatzais, the sida see there at length. Zesha Kasev, and this is what the verse says: Nafla Teres Reishenu. The verse says, Naf, the crown of our head is fallen. Woe is to us that we have sinned. Meaning that sin causes the source of the soul, the crown of our head, topple into the depths of impurity. That's why we have the expression that God is called the humiliated God. Ramak Zachin Lovach as Ramashik the very writes. Ki Eilach Evelyn Godum Azad, there's no greater humiliation deeper than this to God that he is forced to go into Gullus, he's forced to go into exile because me. Rakashi is Bain Hamas, we do say, say, but Malakav was saved, especially a person meditates. And the concept of the way God, the greatness of God, the way he permeates all the worlds and he encompasses all the worlds. For God provides vitality to the created being both in a manner which permeates each recipient according to the individual capacity, as well as in a manner that transcends and encompasses them. Every person meditating upon the greatness according to the range of his intellect and understanding Yes, he will extremely grieve over this. 
the richer one perception of God's majesty, the more intense will his feeling of compassion for his own soul and for its source, the bond and the humiliating of the king. That's number one. Number one, simply you need to push it awake in a compassion. Compassion within yourself, or compassion within above God, to push it, have Rahmanis. I have dragged myself to the lowest of lowest. And then you have to go to the second element. And this is the in one's preparation for a true and direct path of repentance is to crush and subdue the clip and the sickness. Whose entire being is simply grossness and arrogance. As the, as the verse says, if you exalt yourself like an eagle, and the crushing and the subjugation absolutely to dust is the death and nullification of evil. Evil is crushed with a broken and contrite heart. Senses of personal unworthiness, repugnance, and so forth. As explained before in chapter 29, the animal soul, even of a bainly, how much more of a soul of a sinner, the very person himself. When his heart is humbled, his animal soul, which derives from clippers, of course, humbled as well. Thus, crushing and subdining one's arrogance crushes the clip and stuff. Shikos of Zoya, as Zoya writes, al an offering to God, a carbon, is a broken spirit. The offering consists of breaking the spirit, clipping the and this is achieved through a heart broken individual. He called carbon because that's the essence of a sacrifice. He called carbon and a behemoth because every offering was given from the animal. Hulashem Avaya was given, dedicated to God. The attribute of mercy, attribute of mercy. This is why all verses we speak about offering to God refers to him with the God's name, Yud Kevavke, because that's what we're trying to accomplish. Sacrifice is all to become close to God. To become close to God means that I want to connect to God's name. I want to go higher in my connection to my soul which is my connection to God. I will shame and akim, but to the name of God, which is on akim, which indicates the attribute of justice, aim akim and karma, you don't bring an animal. You always want to go to the source of God. You take off. Yim, meaning, what is considered offering to akim? The verse does, after all, state an offering to akim. The offering is the shattering and the removing of the spirit of defilement. This is the meaning of broken spirit. And how do you break the, the, the spirit of the sitrach on the other side? Shalev is when the heart is broken. That completes the Tanya of the day. Pretty heavy teaching of Tanya. Um, but that completes this day's Tanya and Rich. I've already earned and the, uh, oops, sorry, cash sorry, back. Sorry. Today is the 25th day of the month. And Tillim, it's half of chapter 119, the first half of chapter 119 from the letter Aleph, the letter Mem. If you do though the, the, that half of chapter 119, you would do the Chitas. I want to invite you all at 10 o'clock. We're going to have a class in Tanya again. 
still holding in chapter two of Tanya. Everybody's welcome to come at 10 a.m. either at Chabad or on this Zoom number or on Torah Direct. I wish you all a great day, a wonderful week, and the Mitzvah will see you all tomorrow. Continue the Tanya, the Chitas of the day at 8 a.m.